Amen. Uh, can we just say thank you to LifeSpring for bringing it this morning? Nice job. Thank you, guys. Fantastic. Thank you for setting the tone for us. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, my name's Justin, and I'm uh, honored to be here this morning, graduate of 2008, and uh, it's been a heck of a journey since I left here, and uh, I got a picture of my family this morning, talked about uh, my family. This is Noah, Theo, Alice, um, Noah is my, my oldest, and he thinks he's cool with his fake pit vipers on there. Um, yeah, he is pretty cool, though. Uh, and then Theo, my youngest, who is just, he's just a turd. He's a knucklehead, um, just like his dad. And my beautiful queen, Natalie, who I've been married to for 14 years, and my daughter, my princess, Alice. And um, this is at the Boise Hawks game this summer. If you guys are in Boise during the summer, I want to encourage you to go to the Hawks game just right down the road. Lots of fun and pretty good baseball. Um, but we are a sports family. Uh, we, we play baseball, uh, football. Uh, I have the honor of coaching my kids and being a part of the community, investing in kids' lives. Uh, but one thing you need to know about my family is I have a belief system that I live by. And the reality of this belief system is that um, my wife and my kids are gifts given to me. And I have limited time with them. And so every single day, I ask myself this question, what can I pour into them? What can I invest in them? How do I help them understand the realities of the kingdom of God in their hearts, in their minds, and what God is inviting them into? And I live that way because I learned that here at Boise Bible College. I learned that from a professor here that walked beside me and showed me how he loved his family and discipled his family. And so that's a, a really core part of who I am. The reality is, is there's gonna come a day when I don't have as much influence in their life. There's gonna come a day when I have to entrust them over to the Father. They're gonna, my kids are gonna leave my home just like you have left your home and I have to entrust them to the Father. And yes, I may have a relationship with them and I may become more of a coach, um, but the reality of it is is that there's gonna come a day where they're gonna have to go on their own. There's gonna come a day, not to be morbid or dark, there's gonna come a day that either I will go to the Father or my wife will go to the Father and I will have to entrust her to Him. And in these moments when we entrust things, gifts that have been given to us over to the Father, these are sacred, sacred times. Because in these moments when we entrust our, our, our kids or our relationships, our spouses over to the Father, there's oftentimes a narrative or a dialogue that's actually going on inside of us about that situation. For some of us, it's, it might be fear, it might be worry, but for some of us, it might be excitement and, and, and full of potential of the realities of the kingdom of God. These are sacred, sacred moments when these transitions take place where we entrust our closest relationships over to Father, the Father and saying, okay, they're yours now, they're yours and this is not only true for our family relationships, it's true in the relationships that maybe you are involved in right now when it comes to maybe here at Boise Bible College, when it comes to the churches that you're a part of, when it comes to um, the reality that people that you're walking beside and ministering to and discipling, and they begin to maybe wander from the faith. And you chase after them and you check in on them and they don't return your text messages. They don't return your phone calls. And eventually you have to go, Father, I'm entrusting them over to you now because I'm not gonna be that annoying person, Right? No one wants to be that person. And you leave that voicemail, you leave that text message, you say, hey, this is the last time I'm contacting you, but I want you to know that I'm always here for you and that I love you and that Jesus loves you. You entrust them over to the Father. This is true when, when people move away that you're really close to. And, and yes, you may still have a relationship, but that relationship may change. It's not gonna be the same moving forward. People that change churches, uh, people that just disconnect from your life. You have to entrust them to the Father. As we read today from John chapter 17, Jesus is in the process of taking these guys that he has loved, discipled, lived life with for three years, and he is entrusting them to the Father. And he, it's a very sacred moment for Jesus because as you can see from Jesus's words, these are the final things that he's going to say over them and speak about them to the Father. And not only is he speaking to them, he's actually speaking to you. What are these words? And what, what is he saying? And what is the dialogue? And what are the implications for our lives today? Because it has implications for, for you today, 
What are they? John chapter 17 is where we're at. Verse 18, Jesus is saying this prayer to the Father, and he says this, Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. Who is them? You know who they are. It's his what? His disciples, his followers, his closest friends. And he says, I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Then he says this, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Who's he praying for? You, us. What does he say? I pray that they will all be one. Just as you are and I are one, just as, uh, as you are in me, Father, I am in you. What does Jesus pray for? For us. He prays for us to be one. And I think it's really important for us to realize that this call of unity reminds us that Jesus values most is unified relationships amongst his people, amongst his church. That he's calling on us to be a people that are reminded because here's the reality. There's a couple of reasons as to why Jesus is praying this prayer. The first one is this, is we have to be reminded of this over and over and over again. Uh, earlier, Jesus says, said something really powerful about his church. It's the first time the word church is actually used in the New Testament. He said, I will build my church. I will build what? And the gates of will not. I want you to think about that. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And so if it's Jesus' church, there's actually nothing that will stop Jesus' church from being Jesus' church except for one thing, us. Division. You see, oftentimes for us as believers, we believe that the threat is actually out there when it comes to Jesus' church. The threat is not out there. The threat is actually us. (laughs) Are we willing to fight for relationship? Are we willing to fight for unity? Are we willing to fight for oneness? Or are we concerned about the threat out there? The reality is it's not there. It's, It's actually right here. It's between your brothers and your sisters. Look to your left and to your right. The reality is it's right here. Are you willing to fight for one another? Because if we fight for one another, Satan can't do anything to Jesus' church. Well, culture, culture, yeah, culture's always been doing culture things. The church is still alive and still moving forward today, amen? Amen. And it will continue to do that if we're willing to fight for the things that Jesus wants us to fight for, which is relationship, unity, togetherness, and oneness, no matter what it takes, to fight for one another. Why else is this important? Because Jesus tells us later on, verse 21, may they be in us, may his church be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be, there it is again, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Why is unity so important? Unity is so important because really, Jesus' church moving forward is about unified relationships, but in addition to that, the vehicle, the vehicle that Jesus uses to reach the world and make disciples is unified relationships. It's a church that is one. This is the vehicle. And so every single one of us have got to ask ourselves this question is are we fighting for a relational environment for one another of unity and understanding that that's the vehicle with which the world has actually reached? Us, together, in oneness. And this makes sense practically. Have you guys, anybody enjoy road trips? You guys like to do the road trips? Okay. Have you guys been a part of a really bad road trip? Raise your hand. Now, there's two types of different types of bad road trips, Okay. The one road trip is when the car breaks down, you've got engine failure, you get a flat tire, and you're like, this sucks, right? That's horrible. There's a worse road trip than that. The worst road trip is with people that aren't nice, that aren't kind, that you're like, get me out of this vehicle right now. Anybody ever experienced that before? Where you want to strangle the person next to you, right? I have 10 more hours with this person. So, uh, camp reps, maybe? Have you experience that? Yeah, exactly. Like, I hate you right now, right? Going on a road trip where people are not one in relationship, unloving, unloving, joyless, 
chaotic, impatient, unkind, mean. That is the opposite of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the, which is all relational. The best road trips, I think, are the ones where you have that environment and you have to go through those obstacles of a broken down car because you'll never forget them, will you? You'll never forget that. That was the greatest road trip ever. Yeah, kind of. I mean, we had to do this. this is, yeah, but we, we came together and, and we got to where we needed to go. And this is the vehicle from which Jesus calls relationships of how we're going to reach the world, how we get to our destination, how we're going to make disciples, how we're going to reach the lost. It's in relationship, unity, oneness together. This is what Jesus is calling us to. But here is the rub. Here is the rub. You might be hearing me saying, love, 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 love. Yes, love, love, love. But Paul says that we are called to, in relationship, speak the in love. And for some of you, you do need to learn how to love because you've lived on the truth side. And you speak truth, but you do it unloving. And Jesus says, you're just, Paul says, you're just, you're just a gong is what you are. You know all things, but you're a gong. And for some of you, you love, 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 but you never enter into a relationship to say, I'm actually going to risk something and say, I, I, I need to speak truth into your life right now. Because if you don't speak truth in love, I would argue you're not really loving people well. And this is nuance. This is hard. This is hard in ministry when you're walking beside people and you want them to hear your heart, but you also have to call them to something greater that Jesus is asking them to call or to walk into, which is obedience of him and his word. This is difficult. This is hard. Jesus goes on to say, verse 24, Father, I want these whom you have given to me Remember, gifts, disciples, you've given to me. Now he's going to entrust them back to the Father. Given to me to be where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to, uh, revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them. And I will be in them. I want you to notice that. That Jesus is calling on them to be one with Jesus and one with the Father. And when we live in oneness with Jesus and the Father, your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. Your love will be in them. It reminds me of John 13 when Jesus said this, that your love for one another will prove will prove to the world that you are my disciples. How will we be marked as Jesus' children? We love one another really well. There are goods and our bads through the most difficult times. When we have to talk about truth and wrestle with truth, but we're still going to do it lovingly. We're still going to do it with the Spirit of God in us. And Jesus longs for his people to be known as people who are one with him and marked as people of love, unified in relationships, relationships that reach the world, and relationships that are marked by love. This is difficult. It's difficult to do in a world and culture that is growing more and more polarized. Would you guys agree with that? The world is not carrying a banner of unity. The world carries a banner of division, of hatred. Uh, your social media accounts are actually training you to hate the other person on the other side of whatever conversation that you have. Your social media accounts are actually teaching you to only listen to the things that you believe in that's true that you like on that post. To listen to that, to listen to that, to listen to that, and to villainize the person on the other side. What happens when that creeps into the church? The mission stops. Because Jesus' mission, his vehicle, has been unified relationships. And so for you, you, you are going to have to step into a culture you already are, where you have to figure out, how am I going to bring people together? Because I believe there's a lot of room for Jesus' church, and there's a big table for Jesus' church. Are you with me this morning? Big table. With a lot of seats. If we're willing to bring people together. 
This morning, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a pulling back of the curtain of my life, of how this has been something I've had to navigate as a pastor over the last about 15 months. See, in the last 15 months, we started a conversation 15 months ago about the reality of, in culture, there's more and more conversation about the role of women in the church. And for us at Real Life Ministries, the things that we've done, our behaviors, the things that we believed, nothing has changed in regards to our theology when it comes to women's roles. And for those of you guys who are going, women's roles, what does that mean? Just wait until you're junior or senior, first, second, Timothy, Titus, you'll dive into that ABD. How many of you guys have t- tackled that already? Okay, some of you, the rest of you are like, oh boy, all right. And what is he talking about? Well, it's a big co- topic of conversation in the church right now. And people are asking questions about where we stand as a church, questions that weren't being asked 15 years ago. What do we have to do? As a leader, you have to bring clarity so people can have confidence about where you stand and decide if they're going to partner with you and move forward. Well, in this process of meeting with my elders, 15 months of conversations with my elders, with my staff, my elders and staff that vastly different views on this topic. Complementarian, egalitarian. People that love the text, love God's word, and are doing their best to interpret it to the best of their ability. Huge potential for division. Are you with me this morning? Huge potential for division. Huge potential for the enemy to get in and begin to villainize each side. The ability for the enemy to come in and say, Justin doesn't have your best interests at heart. He doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. He thinks you're wrong. Why did this conversation take 15 months? Because we said every single time we had this conversation, once a month at our elders meeting, about once a month as a staff, revisit it. We said this, we will fight for oneness at Real Life Ministries. We will fight for unity at Real Life Ministries. We will fight for one another and not fight to be right. And even though we may agree to disagree, we will keep Jesus' church with everything that we have as one. And as we wrote down clarity about where we stand and behavior of things that we've always done, but we've never put it on paper, because when you put it on paper, feelings start to take place. And as we navigated that and wrote down on paper, I get really excited because we're on the other end of this conversation, unified as one as an eldership, unified one as a staff, and we're moving forward. And nothing's changed theologically. We've just been very, very clear. And now, guess what? The Lord is adding to his number daily of the church. Why? Because we fight for oneness. We fight for unity, even in the most difficult topics. For you, I'm I'm roughly 20 years ahead of you, most of you, I'm guessing. And our culture is going to continue, I believe, to move towards division. You will have to face things that I will never, ever face as I leave this place. You will have to be a, a leader a pastor right now who says, how do I bring Jesus' church together when a culture says we want to rip it apart? And that's what Jesus' prayer was. Oneness. Will you be a leader that brings unity to Jesus' people and his his mission? Will you fight for relationship or will you fight to be right? Even though you might be right, how you fight determines really is the spirit of God alive and work in you. You get to step into this opportunity. We get to step into this opportunity where in a culture that continues to fight for division, this is the amazing thing. This is the amazing thing. When culture has all the other things that are going on, the church, the church has the opportunity to stand up and say, we believe that it's called another way that we can lead and love people. That's how it's always been. That when there's a gap in culture, the church rises to the occasion. And so will you be that type of church? Will you be that type of leader? Will you be that type of pastor? Minister, volunteer, servant, whatever your role is. Will you be someone that fights for a relationship? Will you be a church that stands in the gap? As we wrap up this morning, I've just got a couple things I want you to think about. Is what challenges you today when it comes to Jesus' words of oneness, of being a church that's known by relationship and love? Are you going to lead the way in unity of Jesus' people in his mission? Are you going to fight for relationship? or fight to be right? 
Are you willing to go slow in conversations, in leading, to keep the church one? What do you need to learn to grow in, in maturity, in Christ when it comes to unified relationships? What are the challenges you're facing today? Because some of you are already facing these as you're in the trenches, leading and discipling people right now. What does your next step look like this morning so that we can follow the way that Jesus called us to follow, which is a unified church, one fighting for relationship? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these students, God, that have come here to learn more about you and your word. Thank you, Lord, for their willingness to surrender their will to your will. Thank you, Lord, that they love you and love your word. I pray, God, that they would be people, sons and daughters of you, that fight for your church, that fight for relationship, knowing that the the mission is dependent upon it. God, that you've called us to be a people that are relational, that love one another with everything that we have, our heart, soul, mind, strength, loving you and loving our neighbor, God. Help us to be people that even though we may agree to disagree on topics, that are divisive, that people have different opinions, God, that at the end of the day, people can say, even though we disagree, I know my brother, my sister, I know that he and she, that they love me with everything that they have. May we be marked that way. May these students be marked that way. And God, may you bless them and use them in exponential ways, God, as they learn more about you and as they are thrusted into your mission. We praise you, Jesus, that you partner with us. Thank you. You invite us into your mission. Thank you. We pray this all in your son's name. And all of you guys said, amen. Amen.